Welcome everyone to today's presentation. With us today, we have Jason Williams with DataMars, who's going to be presenting our webinar, which is titled Maximizing Your Fencing Resources. We are Foothills Forage and Grazing Association. We'll be hosting the webinar today. My name is Sonia Bloom, and I'm the Environmental and Communications Coordinator. So I just quickly wanted to um, talk about who Foothills Forage is for those of you who have not um, had a chance to meet us yet. So we are a nonprofit producer driven group. We address issues, ideas and innovations for forage and livestock producers in the South Central location of Alberta. We currently have a board of directors that's made up of 11 volunteer forage producers from across our region. We bring producers together by finding profitable and regenerative ways to produce forages and livestock. We do this through workshops, field tours, events, conferences, webinars, and through our social media, websites, and newsletters. All right, so some housekeeping for today. This is going to be an interactive presentation. We will be taking questions throughout and stopping every few slides to um, address any questions that come up. So if you do have any questions, please go into this little chat box that you can see right here. It looks like a little speech bubble and you can type in your questions. Your questions will be visible by everyone in attendance. Um, please note that you are going to be muted by the administrator. Please leave your microphone on mute. And um, we also have the video turned off. So please don't turn your video on. Um, doing this can cause some delays in technology. So to make everything streamlined, we're just gonna keep everything shut off. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available for viewing on Foothills' website by the end of this week. Okay, so Jason Williams. Jason is the Canadian manager of Datamars Canada. Datamars manufactures Speedrate and Patriot electric fencing products. Jason has sold and serviced electric fencing products since 1998. He also teaches and trains staff in different fencing building techniques on ranches and retail stores in Western Canada. At home, Jason grazes cattle near Henley, Saskatchewan, and enjoys his horse-crazy family. You have Jason's contact information, which will also be available at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Sonia. There we go. Okay. Well, of course, right at the bottom. Pardon my. Well, we know how it's going to end. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Perfect. Yes, thank you very much, Sonny. Thanks for everyone that's attending. Um, I'm Jason Williams. My information showed up there. Please, please, please phone, text, email, anytime you have questions, concerns, um, queries, issues, that's why I'm here. Please um, get a hold of me at any time. Um, I appreciate the chance to visit with your um, with your group today. And yes, it is in the middle of the day, so we're hoping this is is okay. Um, Hello, that's not me. If we can yeah. mute the phone, please. <laughs> There we go. Okay. Sure, I'll take February 16th. Yeah. Thank you, Sonia. <laughs> so the topic today, we wanted to talk a little bit more about what we can do, not only with electric fencing, but maybe give you some other ideas on how you can better your business by asking different questions and um, just some benefits on, on uh, rolling the whole package in together for you. So Datamars is the company that uh, we manufacture ear tags, we manufacture electric fencing products, we manufacture ear tag readers, um, 
pet microchips, we do quite a variety of, of things. So um, it's, it's all really, the whole point of it is to better your business, to give you enough information to make great um, business choices. And one thing we've, we've really improved on is uh, we have two approved CCIA tags for the Canadian market. Our most popular one is quickly becoming this. It's called the comfort ear. And if you look at the shape of the comfort ear, it sort of emulates the cow's uh, or the calf's ear itself. It eliminates the, the uh, rubbing and the swelling after application. And this portion, um, the large portion of the tag itself actually is allowed to spin very freely on the blue or colored rivet. We do all the breeds and we have the regular yellow CCIA tags as well. So if you can keep those tags in the ear longer, you're gonna keep that information um, with that animal where it should be. And so we feel that's a better choice for your business. We have terrific ear tag readers. Some are very simple. They can just capture that ear tag number and send it somewhere. And then others like the one on the screen have a full keypad where you can type in animal information regarding the cow that it came out of. Uh, if it was a hard pull at birth, if you had to treat with various antibiotics, you can record that right in the ear tag reader. Okay. Jason, you're still on the first screen, the open screen. Oh, so mine, okay. Thanks, Rob, Mine. for pointing that out. Sorry about that. There. How's this? Yeah, we're okay. getting better. I was having trouble with the, uh, it was going on mine, but here we go. Here's the ear tag that I was speaking blindly about. So that's a comfort ear, uh, ear tag. I'm going to just go. Here's the shape of the comfort ear. Again, it emulates the ear itself. That's the name, comfort ear. And very pliable plastic so the tags are not breaking right here so many people come up to trade shows and they show me a tag from our competitor look where the tag breaks well ours doesn't break there okay so we can keep those tags longer here's a picture of our ear tag reader again complete full keypad where you can use it like a uh, a data capturing tool and device we would send that over to a livestock scale so many of our decisions and choices are made on guessing the weights and we cannot guess any longer, not for better business anyways. Ours are fully programmable. Um, we don't come at you, the producer saying you have to structure your cow herd like this. We want you to program your own, okay? So that makes us a little bit better on your business side because we want you to decide your future on that. And then we have a digital platform that allows you to mash all of that information together. Um, but once again, this is free, it's free of charge for your, for TrueTest uh, customers. So um, this is the platform, actually, you're going to be able to turn on and off your electric fencer. We have one uh, in testing right now with the CSA for the approvals where you can actually use your smartphone and this um, app to turn your fencer on and off and to monitor which areas you're fencing uh, remotely from your phone. And it does not cost you uh, cellular data. Um, okay. So we want you to use all the data that's available for you to make the, uh, those tough decisions. And you can just structure it on, on your cow herd itself. Who's looking for animals like I can market. What animals on my place are actually saleable? Um, who's looking for grass to rent? How much grass do I have to rent? What do I need to rent? Um, what can I offer people that are looking? Do I have to change something? So these are things that with the right information, you can make those decisions. You have to ask yourself them. Um, when will things be ready? When can I regraze? It might be next year. Um, when are my animals going to be ready for sale into a certain weight break? Um, that's on your marketing side, okay? Where can we improve as, as farmers and ranchers? 
and why do I need a change? Why do I not need to change? Uh, why wouldn't I look at some changing? How much feed are we going to need? Um, just guessing at body size and demand um, leaves us with either some short falls on the feed side or, or maybe extra feed that we can put into investment animals if things line up properly. So really the topic today is to maximize uh, resource and so we need to know, you know, where to start with our electric fence resource. We have to understand basically how it works. Um, were these animals trained to the fence through the first portion of the year? I was talking right before I got on with Sonia and a fellow south of Assiniboia, Saskatchewan that is He's just kicking animals out into some swath grazing now, and they just had like three feet of snow. These animals have never seen electric fence. He's not gonna have a really great uh, time. So those animals should be trained earlier in the year so that they respect the fence now. Um, can we reuse some portions of, of other pastures that we fence, maybe you have temporary fencing somewhere else, we can take the temporary down and we can use that on our on our swath grazing rather than buy new products. Um, and what's upcoming on those grazing calendars? You know how many days you should have a basic idea on your resource and what those swaths are yielding so that uh, you can set up what your what your uh, rotational moves are going to look like moving forward through the winter here. Maybe you need to, to build a new fence or maybe we can use existing fence. I'm, I'm all about that. If we can use a structure that you already have, that's a way better um, situation. I'd like to use a one fencer for the whole farm. It's not always possible, but that's, um, from a sales side, some companies would rather sell you 10 different fencers. I would rather sell you one that can do, you know, five, six, 10 different jobs. It's not always possible, but it's, it's something to think about. Um, most of you, if you were on my spring talk, you're going to remember these. There's two slides in here and, and I have to keep coming back to them because every week, I get call after call from new producers that don't understand how electric fence works. And that's fine. I'm, I've been doing it 20 years and I'm still learning. But in the end, um, what happens on the fence is a current travels down the fence and it waits for something to touch the wire. In this uh, example, it's a cow. So she touches one of these two wires. They're both hot. You can see that here. The shock then, this is in the summer. The shock will travel through her hooves and back through the soil to the ground rods, okay? And then it's pushed back up into the energizer through that, um, through the wire, okay? That's what completes the circuit. She doesn't feel that pain or the shock until this happens, okay? Then she feels the shock like that. So you need soft, somewhat damp soil. I say that tongue in cheek because we have a lot of drought in Canada, uh, but with some conductivity. And no matter which wire she touches, she feels this shock because of this process, okay? It's not always easy to describe that over the phone. Uh, so a lot of these conversations take some time, but what we're dealing with now and what this gentleman was faced with is this cow in this example is standing on snow and ice. And snow and ice is no different than an insulator on the fence here. It insulates her <laughs> from contacting the soil. If you can't touch the soil, we can't utilize the ground rods to complete the circuit and give her a shock. That's why cattle that have never seen electric fence and get pushed out on swath grazing or bale grazing this time of year, they just wander through the fence and it doesn't matter how many volts are on this wire. 
That's the frustrating part. You can have, he told me he's got 12.1, that's 12,100 volts on his wire and cattle are walking through it because they don't feel the shock. So really what's happening is a little bit of the shock goes into the ice and snow and then it stops. So in the winter, more often than not, we have to build a fence that can carry this current back to the ground rod and complete the circuit through the wire instead of the soil, okay? The trouble with this system is if you're grazing underneath the bottom wire, there's no power on it anyways. If you're touching the top, there's at least a small chance she might feel a little tingle. They really have to touch both animals at the same time, or not animals, both strands of wire at the same time. So we really wanna make sure that the wire distance is the same as the cow that's grazing it. It should be between her nose and her eyeballs for distance, okay? That ensures that she will touch both wires. That ensures that she gets a shock, so she stays behind the wire. Um, I still, like I mentioned, I, I still get two, at least two calls a week for people learning about electric fence, which is fantastic, but there's so much knowledge that is needed out there. And sometimes it's not by choice. They, they might have overgrazed their current setup. Um, maybe the drought took them by surprise or their, their animals, the demand on the feed resource is just larger than what they were prepared for. So they have to make a decision. If they can't sell them, how do they manage those animals? So we're helping them manage with fencing, but they have to start um, with those basics. That's the troubling spot is the basics if applied this late in the season are, are tough to get around. We need the training done earlier in the summer so that mentally those cattle just stop touching the wire this time of year. That's why a single wire works in the winter is because they've been trained through the summer. And again, as I mentioned here, late season calls sometimes means we miss the training opportunity. So we can build a two strand fence and we can contain them, but they more often than not, they don't want to make a two strand uh, fencing system on their swath grazing or bale grazing. Jason, we did get a question here. Are you ready? Yes, I am. I was just gonna ask. Excellent. All right. So the question was, will steel fenced posts just hot insulated still need to be grounded back to fencers ground or every post be good enough grounding? Um, it still has to connect back to the ground on the fencer. And the structure that we build, we wanna make sure that if it's carrying power, that it is insulated um, on that fence post. So what can happen if you allow the ground wire to just touch a steel post, it doesn't always make it back to the fencer itself. I'm not saying it will not work, but um, it may not complete the circuit as efficiently as we would like it to. Because it, this all happens in a fraction of a second from the point that she contacts both wires to the point that uh, the, pulse runs back to the fencer, it takes about a third of a second. So it's very quick. We don't want that delayed any further because if it takes longer than a second or two, she can be through the fence and down the, down the lane or on the road or escaping <laughs> before we contain her. Um, it's, it's a similar situation where some people will put random uh, ground rods in and around their fencing system. And that totally confuses where the, the circuit's trying to complete itself. We've got to complete the circuit at the electric fencer or it will not maintain cow control. If you divert those that voltage through the ground 
over to the west when it should be going back to the east where the fencer is, um, you'll have cattle climbing out. It's it, that ground wire still has to connect to the fence itself without distractions, if I can say that. Um, so going straight on the steel post, it should work because the ground is so frozen. Um, but if you could, it would be best to insulate that the ground wire as well. But I, I probably I watch the cattle if they back off the fence with that structure, just leave it at that and, and you don't need to put any insulators on the ground wire. But I'd let the cows tell you. Thanks, Jason. Um, another question just came up. Um, how does vegetation touching the wire affect the grounding? Do you need to mow the fence area? Yeah. So terrific question. Um, we always have more voltage at the start of May than we do mid-June when that alfalfa and, and our forage is at its strongest because every tiny um, piece of forage that is touching the wire is a, is a minuscule amount of voltage that we're going to be losing. So you need, <clears throat> we need lots of ground rods, okay? Um, if the fencer feels it's too hard to push through the deep grass, it pushes the voltage backwards into the ground rod. If you add another ground rod, it now switches back because now it feels, okay, it is a little bit easier to go down the fence than it is to play back on the ground rod. And if you add a third or fourth or tenth ground rod, you will totally force the voltage further down the fence rather than have it be affected by forage like that. Um, power is lazy. It's going to take the path of least resistance. So if we do not have enough ground rods, it's easier for the fencer to push voltage backwards onto the ground rod than it is onto our fence structure. So you want the more ground rods, the merrier. Um, depending on the size of your electric fencer, you, our rule of thumb is one rod for every two joules of output power. So we have a fencer called an X12 or a 12,000i, which is a 12 output joule fencer. We need at least six ground rods on that unit. And if it's extremely dry late season, we might add one or two more. So now you're up to eight. Every farm is different. Uh, every farm changes from April until August. Every fencer is different and the load we, our fence, as our fence expands, the demand on our ground system goes up. So um, if, you're, if you're questioning anything, just add another ground rod and you'll probably save yourself a lot of trouble. 10 feet further down the wire than your other ground rods. Keep them 10 feet apart. Excellent, thanks Jason. I think we're good to go forward. Okay, perfect. So if we want to look at maximizing a feed resource on the farm, um, we can look at different options and then we can make the choices from there. So if you have some stockpiled annual forage, you can really, there's a whole bunch of scenarios that you can run through. Some people let it fully mature or mature at least enough um, before the frost hits that it's, it's grazable and we're not worried about nitrates and we can just leave it standing and graze it that way. Some people like to graze the whole field. Um, I'd like to see it structured in, in a move every four to seven days. Um, maybe not quite as vital in something like if you're grazing a standing oat crop or what have you. I've seen a lot of variations on uh, winter feeding that happened, especially in Saskatchewan. Um, it's uh, and if they can get by, that's that's terrific. But you want to make sure we're not worried about uh, nitrates, and um, make sure they have a water source. That's a that's a tough thing. We um, I'm looking out the window there. We've had more snow in the last two weeks than we have in the last five winters, and uh, which is great. So cows can lick this soft, damp snow. Uh, typically around Hanley, Saskatchewan, we do not get snow that an animal could uh, survive on without a water source. It's just ice. It's just rock hard ice. 
So you need to be conscious of that. Um, animal care starts to come into play. But some people are good utilizing standing feet. So what we want to do is ensure that the outside edge of that area is, is hot with good power on our fence. And if you do need to make paddocks, you can draw your paddock power from the outside edges. So uh, those animals will be maintained inside your fence perimeter. Um, some people will knock this down and they, they graze this. We, we have tough time over here uh, swath grazing. We're on a big migratory bird, um, I guess fly zone. <laughs> so uh, we might get, I, I would hate to, if, if we have on one side would probably be 120 acres. There are some days where you can't see bare ground or snow geese. So they just run roughshod over uh, swath grazing projects. So we might have to bail those up and uh, put some iron into it. I'm not saying that's the best solution, but it's better than the birds taking all your feed away. Um, if we're doing this, fence, if my fingers are the swath, we fence across the swaths, okay? Don't fence down the swath. They have to fence across the swath so that when the snow is deep, those animals start to open up uh, the swath itself. They start to graze down the swath and um, in a walk in their forward, they're walking forward grazing as they go and they'll utilize the swaths a lot better. If you fence with the swath, they're, you know, in two, three, four feet, they're, they're through the swath already and they lose their weight in the snow. Okay, so fence across your swaths. Some of these crops, we can graze them early and then just leave them and, and almost graze a regrowth in the fall as a standing. Um, Again, we still want to keep the perimeter of our fence hot and, and pull our power off of the perimeter. You might cut and bale graze at a later point. Um, if you've got a scale, it, it, it is nice to figure out what those cows weigh. Work with your nutrition team to figure out what her demands are going to be and utilize a little bit of ambient temperature. Um, to make those adjustments. Plus 20 Celsius, those cows need less to grow <laughs> and maintain than they do when it's minus 20. Ambient temperature makes a difference, um, but more often than not, people don't even know what their cows weigh. Um, you've, you've also got to know what your field is going to yield so you can figure that out for setting up your bale graze situations. Um, and if, if you set up for a, a move every four days, uh, maybe every five days, people ask me, I've bale grazed for a lot of years, so they, they ask me, well, what about wastage? Um, I hardly see any wastage, but really we, we aim for about a seven day move and by day six, there's no bales there. Like they're, they're cleaning up for the last day and they clean that up and then they go in um, to the new stuff on, on day seven. And, uh, you know, we, we rarely leave trash, but I can monitor that. And, and there's some of these areas where I want to leave trash. If it's a, it's a low area with foxtail, barley coming up and that stuff's terrible. Uh, manure is the best thing for it. So I grazed heavier on that and I moved them sooner to, to keep putting more trash on those uh, weak areas. So, um, again, you might want to graze it first and then swath graze it and hit it after the snow or, or later season. Um, swath grazing doesn't need snow. This was hard for people that I used to deal with around Swift Current to get through their thought process. Um, it doesn't have to be even cold out. If it, some of those pastures were, there was zero nutrients left by the end of July and they'd keep them out there until October because it was an open fall. Um, if they had some barley and oat blends to be grazing on in August, September and October, they would have put huge weight on those calves. The cows would respond a little better. We don't need snow. 
the swath grays. Um, it's a great tool, but again, you want to fence across the swaths and uh, prevent them uh, from, from getting lost uh, when it does get uh, wet and snowy out. So some people graze early, then they'll silage the regrowth. Again, we want to keep the perimeter hot and, and pull those paddocks off of that outside edge. Uh, more people are silaging and then either grazing something that's underseeded or reseeding after silage. Want to get more than one use out of every acre. Um, this is like a broken record. Again, perimeter hot, use the perimeter to carry the, the power all the way around and then pull the power into our paddocks from there. Just talked about that. So for pasture fencing, um, you might have some native pasture. We have a lot of tame blends that are being seeded. You might have access to some rented lands that have a forage base focus on there. Um, you might be renting land with a grain focus. Um, I talked to a lot of grain farmers that are interested in how we can work with cattle or incorporating cattle back into their organizational uh, business plan to utilize those acres more than once and to, to fix their soil. A lot of grain farmers are realizing that the soil is not in the greatest of health and they can use, um, you know, we can use grazing livestock and these different forage blends to improve that. So if you have native, it's already sown native grass um, and you want to use it in season, you can actually keep use electric fence to keep them off of certain areas until you want it grazed. Some people don't want to graze native until mid-June or even later, sometimes not until the fall. So whatever you want, you keep that in mind and you can use electric fence to prevent grazing at the wrong time. We can use it to protect our, our water sources, or we can use it to encourage them to water only in one area and not utilize the other. Uh, it might even be the same water source, but if you want them in one contained area, um, we can protect those uh, stream banks and what have you um, as you go along. So it's very uh, crucial to utilize electric fencing in certain areas like that. For anyone new, I can't stress this enough. Just start with a simple a single cross fence on your largest paddock. Ensure there's water on both sides, but the whole point of it is like one cross fence. I've heard it's it will give you seven days extra grazing on your cycle. Um, you have to manage to that, but we know it'll get at least four extra days on your grazing. That's just putting up one cross fence. So if you think about all of your different paddocks and you put, you know, a one more cross fence on all of your paddocks, you really start to see things accelerate as far as uh, grass utilization. But again, we don't, typically we don't always want that grass to mature by the time we've grazed it, uh, all of our paddocks one time. Sometimes we will. Um, buck brush, again, I use bale grazing to hammer down buck brush. It's the thing that cows typically won't go in there and graze. Uh, there might be knee high grass in the middle of it, but they don't uh, tackle it. So when it's cold out this time of year, we'll feed extra heavy on uh, buck brush patches and, and back them up into the tree line. Like we lose a lot of grazing land to encroachment and it's expensive to manage. So if we can use animals to, to fight that back, it's, it's something to look at. Again, tame grasses, the same theory goes, uh, if you can put one cross fence up, you'll, you'll extend your grazing by a few days for every fence you put up. We can change our, our layouts of the tame forage. Um, and always keeping access to water in mind. Like um, I'd heard 500 yards before, and, and it was um, another Foothills presentation um, in the spring where they covered this. So 
anything more than 400 yards, uh, gain and utilization really goes down. So animal performance is best uh, if they can almost see the water source. Then they're not rushing up as a group. Um, they're happy to stay grazing where their neighbor goes up and gets a drink and vice versa. It's not a herd, not as much of a herd mentality at the, at the water tank. And then we get better utilization of the grass further further out. If, if it's too far, the animals really hang out at the water source and they damage all that grass around the water source and they don't head into those far reaching areas. So, um, so one way to, to maximize after this fencing is done, we want to get through the last paddock before it heads out, um, typically. Now, the argument's been raised and it's it's probably a good argument that you should leave at least one of your grazing paddocks to fully head out before um, either leave it till next spring and not graze it or let it fully head out uh, before animals go in there. We see uh, animals can seed grass for us a lot of times. So uh, we'll see them spread those around um, as the season goes on, but you can you can use electric fence to prevent uh, grazing before we want them to as well. Work with there's a lot of good resource in our seed companies nowadays. A lot of support. Uh, they're not just focused on grain anymore, which is so nice because they understand how the varieties work. They understand the different uh, soil types and length of season depending where you're at. So. If you're up higher up in the foothills versus somewhere around Olean, um, you're going to probably get different results uh, with similar seeds. So work with your company to target those uh, varieties and, and to make a grazing uh, plan on your team. So if you look at rented land, um, I think a big thing would come down to the rental agreements. I should briefly stop. Sonia, are there any questions before we move ahead? No, we haven't had any more, Jason. Okay, perfect. I'll just keep rolling. We've got 24 minutes left. So, um, duration of rental agreement, uh, what the current fencing structure looks like, or soil structure, I guess, feed structure. Um, what is your personal ability to manage? This is. Um, it's hard to look ourselves in the mirror, okay? We need to admit our shortfalls and, and ask for help, or at least factor in the cost of getting that help uh, to make a better decision. You might need to rent equipment, maybe you have equipment, that it all comes into play. So if you have a short-term agreement, say less than five years, um, it may not be advantageous to seed forage or to seed uh, grass I guess but what here's one scenario that a, a few uh, people have talked about and, and how it works is uh, to maximize your short-term rental agreement so in in the spring of your first year you would seed something like fall triticale and you know maybe a type of clover these prices here talk to your seed companies I might be low, I might be high, but that's a, a rough estimate on what that's gonna cost. And then you're gonna need fertilizer and some chemical, probably a pre-seed burn off. Um, odds are the land you get a hold of is dirty and needs a good uh, hit with a roundup, but I could be wrong. Anyways, it basically allows two years of grazing because what we do year one is you graze it in a way and you never let it head out. And then the spring of the next year, you start grazing it again with the thought that I, I need to stay ahead of this grass um, and I never want it to head out. And you'll basically get two years of grazing. And then um, you follow up year three and four, the same, the same program. You seed it and then you graze it for two years. And then the last year, just do something where you know you'll get a, a return with for swath grazing or or in season grazing, or maybe you want to cut it for green feed and haul the hay off of there. That, that's up to you. But 
he just seen it something like oats. You know, that's a basic five year rotation, but you have to price out everything before making these decisions. Um, it's just an idea. And really you can't utilize it properly if you don't have invest in uh, electric fence to, to, to control their grades, speed them up, slow them down, prevent them, hold them on certain areas. And if you use a temporary product, you take those items home when you're done with your agreement. Maybe they sell the land, maybe you have a 10 year agreement, but they, something changes in their family and they sell the land on you. Well, now you're in trouble, right? So if it's uh, temporary, you just use temporary fence and all those products are your own. You have a chance to go longer than five years then of course seeding grass looks starts to uh, make sense it's probably around 60 to 80 bucks first year some people want to uh, underseed something the first year to make sure they get a crop you don't want to if it's owned land you can just seed grass um, you know especially in Saskatchewan if first year is a disaster we, we really don't get good rain um, so if you seed it with oats, at least you'll get something year one, get rid of some weeds. Um, and then look at success stories from similar areas. They okay, work with the seed companies to find you, uh, you know, someone to work with in your area that has the same soil type and what have you. And you might have a blend of permanent fence and, and temporary, you know, maybe there's old barbed wire on the, on the, the land that you seeded, well, good, we can use that. If it's four strand, maybe it's good enough to use. Um, maybe we just put some temporary uh, hot wire in front of that four strand barbed wire. Uh, and that can come with us when we finish up our, our agreement as well. Um, more people buying chaff bunchers. Some are buying them for their neighbor's combines. So the cow man makes an investment of a chaff buncher, sticks it on the neighbor's combine and he can graze uh, pea chaff and, and uh, straw piles and whatnot. Um, and at the same time, they can graze headlands and, and sloughs that might be on the farmland. So the farmer gets uh, that taken care of. He doesn't have to burn anything in the fall. Uh, some of these agreements are nice for the cowman can utilize that land for nothing if he buys the the bunchers. Other time they still need to pay for for the the rental of the land, but it is uh, pretty advantageous on the cost side to look at that. And some just want you to you know you can find people that allow you to graze headlands and sloughs after a normal harvest. Okay, at least they're getting two two uses out of every acre. Um, Keep in mind, you might need a solar uh, situation on your electric fencer on those remote sites. So that comes at a cost as well. Any questions? Hi, Jason. Yes, um, we have two. The first one is, is there any way to calculate extended grazing days on native grass with several sections of land? And um, she followed it up by saying that they're currently cross fencing nine sections into six sections and three sections from August to November. Six and three, August to November. So they're looking at this as a utilizing it twice by chance, or this is. Um, I wonder if it makes more sense for me to unmute Lorna and then she can answer your question. Does that work? Sure. Okay. Yeah. One second here. Oh, I can't unmute her. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there, I did. Does Perfect. that work? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so yeah, uh, Jason, we just recently with Electric Fence um, tried this the last two, three years and it's to keep them off the side they always want to go home to. But right. native grass is only grazed from 
August to November. They're on tame hay the rest of the time. We try not to take them out there. We try to give it some growing time. Perfect. So, so like when you said with the grazing, you know, if you put one cross fence, you get this much. If you put in another cross fence, so that's kind of what where I'm getting at, you know? Right, so I think I'm reading into those, the people that make those comments, I think that is more, um, so if you would be conventionally grazing that through the summer season, because what's happening on your place is all that grass is fully mature and you're not yeah. utilizing until these later months, the August to November. But um, in Saskatchewan, I know what I charge, I charge a uh, dollar forty um, for a cow calf pair per day on my place because that's yeah. I, I took in some cattle out so I think value to you that's probably a low estimate and, and a lot of people tell me I should charge more but the same <laughs> there's other benefits because they they put up some hay for me they um, I, I really work with this family so I'm I'm fine charging them a dollar forty a day uh, for a pair but um you know you might be able to put a number like that in for for the value of that maybe even a dollar fifty um i don't know if that answered your question lorna but that's it, it does i'm just wondering if we and we've got a weed in there that a uh, new weed that's kind of moved in that we're not happy with so i guess right. that would be value too that if we but native like we don't like to overgraze it no, so it's so right? sensitive. Yeah. yeah so the law and you're right the longer you can leave the native the, the better off definitely um because i think if if you would be on that you know even in late june early july you would you'd see that weed um probably replicate a lot faster okay that, no that answers it thank you yeah, no, good question though. No, no more questions, Jason. Okay, perfect. So what I have next is a little, I've got to get rid of my pointer, laser pointer, um, are some videos. I can send these um, to anyone that would like, Sonia. They can, like I said before, anyone can, can have this recording. I can personally send some of these videos uh, if you would like as well. I only have like three or four of them. And uh, this first one deals with how to repair fence wire without buying more tools or parts. So my, my employer probably thinks, well, we wanna sell tools and parts, but the farmer in me is like, well, I'll teach you how, <laughs> I'll teach you how to use the, your two hands and save you spending more money. So uh, we'll play this through. The sound was working earlier. I hope it works again. And uh, like I said, I can send these to anyone who would like. So this is how you join two pieces of broken high tensile wire with your bare hands. Okay, we're gonna show you how to tie a uh, proper knot in high tensile wire. You just take one of our strands of wire Make a loop, bring it over top of itself. Hold that loop in your left hand. Take your other wire, come up from the bottom of the loop. Underneath the first wire, back down. I can hold this back down through itself. Pull that away from us, pull the first one toward us. There's the start of our knot. We can tighten the wire. That shrinks our knot. So this knot gets, these ends get longer, the tighter. So it's sort of cut off there. What I'm trying to explain is the tighter the knot becomes, the um, 
the tighter the knot becomes, the shorter, no, sorry, the longer the ends become. So it's tightening onto itself. High tensile wire will not break if it's bent. If you kink it, it will break and it runs back and, and then you get upset. But if you just bend the wire around itself, it does not break. Um, then we would take this strand here and I would wrap it around this wire and I would take this strand and I would wrap it around that wire. That's a way to repair your fence without um, buying a tool or another device, okay? This one, um, this talks about using what's called an inline strainer. It's like what most people would call a tightener and how the tightener fits into the fence. Um, this was my first COVID beard. It looks a little gray there, sorry. I need uh, just for men maybe, but uh, this is uh, utilizing one item and it has two uses. So there's two videos that I'll play on this. I'm gonna show you how to use the true test inline strainer on high tensile wire. The strainer has a slot on one side. He and the other slot comes up underneath the wire. You attach your tightening tool, twist the wire. Tightening tool is designed to bind so you can safely apply the keeper. Drop that through the holes. And it sits safely in the middle of your fence. So I must have needed my coffee. I was a little bit shaky there, but so this tightener will pull wire from this side as well as this side. So it pulls from two directions. An inline tightener is the best way to tighten long stretches of wire. We do not need the wire fiddle string tight, okay? It's, it's not there to prevent the animals from crashing through. It's there to hurt the animal enough that it stays on one side of the fence or the other when it comes in contact with it, okay? So you can actually let it sag a little bit between your fence posts. If it sags a little bit between the fence posts, deer or elk or moose will not break your wire. It's a big complaint with uh, barbed wire cowboys on their high tensile. They say, well, the animals break it. Well, then your fence is too damn tight, okay? It's supposed to flex, it's supposed to be loose. You don't need a post every 16 feet. So now I'll show you another use for this same uh, strainer or tightener. So here's another use for the Stayfix or Patriot inline strainer. Our strainers have a hole in the center of the bobbin. That's how you can you understand this is a true test product. This is not an imitation. Ours has a hole in the center. Where that can be helpful is if you have to do a quick repair on your fence, you can actually feed wire from two directions through the bobbin. And start tightening with the tool. create a repair in the fence. Now this wire is not very tight, but you get the idea. So we can repair the, the wire with up. So again, um, you use the same tool, but that's another way that we can both repair the wire and tighten at the same time. So more than one use out of uh, an item that you purchase. This video, um, this here is called a weave-in standoff. 
And we spoke about that rented land that might have some barbed wire on it. So here's like one, two, three, four strands of fairly old barbed wire. Um, if I'm renting this land, I don't want to put too much of an investment in because it's not my land, right? So you can go out and buy these weave-in deals. They will allow you to run a strand of hot wire through the insulator. It will come into view in a second here and keep it off of the barbed wire, but we use the barb as a structure to hold the insulator, okay? Then when your rental agreement comes and finishes up, you can just unweave them and take them home with you, okay? So you just use a flat blade screwdriver. Twist it top and bottom. And our hot wire goes through this portion of that insulator. Very underutilized tool for how much barbed wire there is in our country. Um, this is a really great solution. One thing I should have done in this video is mount this close to a fence post. Down in the center of the wire, it, it doesn't work as well. You, you should mount it near a fence post um, for best results. So with five minutes and 30 seconds left for some questions, that's all I had today. So I hope you got some ideas on how to maximize um, some resources on farm uh, with the electric fence. Thanks, Jason. We'll give it just here a couple seconds to see if any questions come in. Sure. I should mention this web page that I have on the screen it's a lot of uh, characters, but we're developing a learning academy online. So lots of video content, lots of uh, interactive cartoon type uh, uh, situations that talk people through the building process, through the process of deciding on which electric fencer might work best for you. Um, there's scale selection, there's troubleshooting. So there's a whole bunch of little videos and, and short training sessions that you might thoroughly enjoy. They're very well done. Uh, they're adding more every few weeks. And uh, a big part of what I do is I just review them and try to make them more North Americanized because they tend to utilize cattle we don't see uh, outside of New Zealand and some terminology, but uh, very nicely done. And uh, there's a lot of knowledge there. So feel free to take this information down and uh, start working through the Livestock Training Academy. Thanks, Jason. Um, we did get a question just now. Um, how long does fence breaking take? Fence breaking um, your animals, I'm guessing. Typically, if those animals contact the fence twice in one or two days, they're trained. They, they quickly realize whatever I just touched against, they get a response right away. So if, if they touch the fence and the response is pain, the first time they might not put two and two together, but the second time they're pretty well trained. Um, sheep need about three. <laughs> Cattle easily done with one or two, um, but yes, the more times we can have them contact the wire, the better. And and sometimes in the spring, um, what I would advise is even in our calving pasture, if there's a small section where they maybe come up to water, I'm not saying right to the watering bowl or the watering area, but near where they're loafing around, um, energize, those portions and just as cattle are drifting around maybe they want to scratch a little bit because they're tired of their winter get rid of some of that winter hair and everything we want them to feel a, a pretty sharp tingle um, before you kick them out on your regular pasture thanks jason and now sonia um i know a lady named lorna had asked one of the questions do you have record of who else asked questions. Yes, I will. I can share that with you. I just had another question come in. Yes. 
Are the EID tags reusable? Example, if the original animal is called, can it be used on the replacement animal? Um, according to the government laws and guidelines, no. Do we make a use reusable? By all means, Our, like the, the tags don't go bad. Uh, we make a version of an ear tag that is identical to the CCIA tag that we can use in other animals, but we can't we can't in good faith sell them in Canada because they're supposed to be one use, one animal. But yeah, good question. Okay, thank you. I haven't had any more come in. Um, one thing that I will do for everybody on the call is this link that Jason has up to that academy. I will make sure that when I send you the email saying, hey, the video is available for viewing, that I include that link for you guys as well. So why I asked, was that now five questions, Sonia? We've had... Six. Six. So the first two, I have two. Let me see that. Ooh. Of these four bags. Um, you let me know. We'll do that after, uh, Sonia. The first two get those. The, the next four get this little thing. This is called a charging, where is it? There, charging pod. So you actually set your device, cell phone or whatnot, on top of it, plug it in, and it will charge your device. So the other four will get charging pods. Okay, excellent. We'll connect yeah. after Jason and figure out the logistics of getting that. So if you guys ask the question, then we will be in contact with you probably within the next few days. Yeah, and I'll just send it in uh, through Canada Post, if that's okay. Excellent. Okay, well, before I let everybody go, Jason, I'm going to stop making you the presenter. I just wanted to point out a couple more webinars that we have coming up that might be of interest if you guys enjoyed this one. Um, I think I can just share my screen. Okay, excellent. So we have two more webinars coming up on November 25th. We have one where we're gonna be talking about planning your forage year using a systems approach. So what we're gonna talk about is um, things to look for when you're planning your forage year and um, different techniques and tips and a whole bunch of other stuff. We're gonna have Graham Finn with Union Forage presenting on that one. And then on December 10th, we have a Marginal Lands and Hidden Opportunities webinar. This one's going to be based on um, creating opportunities for you guys on your land on production and ecological benefits. So if you're interested in either of those, you can just go to foothillsforage.com and we have our webinar section right here. Click on the upcoming and then you can register for the ones that you are interested in. That is all I have today. Here you can get Jason and my contact information. If you guys have any feedback or any questions that come from it, please don't hesitate to reach out to either of us. And we hope you guys are having a great fall, I guess, early winter, um, and taking easy. So, oh, sorry, I do have one more question. Oh, thank okay. you, Hannah. It was really great. So thanks, everybody, for taking the time to be with us this afternoon. We really appreciate it. Perfect. And thanks for having me. Yes, thanks, Jason. You bet. Excellent. Thanks, everybody.